okay so uh, you know this is a uh, basic anatomy of the heart you know which uh, most of us are well versed with in which you know on the left side of the heart uh, you have the left atrium you have the left ventricle you have the mitral valve you know with the cardiac contractions the aortic valve it opens and then the blood flows out through the heart uh, into the entire body on the right side of the heart there is the right atrium there is right ventricle there is a tricuspid valve and with the uh, contractions of the right side the pulmonic valve opens and the blood goes into the lungs so uh, this is a basic heart anatomy i thought that i'll start with this as we move on this is a li little detailed uh, anatomy of the heart in which you know as the blood moves out from the aorta uh, there are branches you know which which come out the brachycephalic trunk as you all can see the left subclavian artery and then through the aorta the blood is going uh, to various parts of the body and similarly on the right hand side through the pulmonic valve the blood flows into the lungs the pulmonic artery uh, pulmonary artery it has its branches and uh, this is just a basic description of the heart uh, this is a nice 3d representation of this so you know it's it's a it's a very cool video so i thought to include in this you know you'll see the valves you'll see the vessels it's it's a very cool video so i i i i would like all of you to have Why? a look It's a very nicely done uh, job. I found this on LinkedIn and thought to include in this presentation. So this is a very nice 3D view of how the valves they actually open. This is how it it, it you know it actually happens. So on uh, uh, the main screen, on the main screen you are seeing the pulmonic valve, the aortic valve, and the two bigger valves which you see are the mitral and the tricuspid. So, so this is how it actually. Representation of uh, what goes on in the heart, you know how the contractions happen and how the uh, valves they open and how then the blood rushes out uh, through the different parts of the heart. This is again a schematic representation of what goes on uh, the left atrium. Uh, the mitral valve opens. It goes into the left ventricle then the aorta opens and through the aorta the blood goes uh, to various parts of the body and this is the right hand side where from the right atrium it, the blood is going into the right ventricle from where through the pulmonary artery it is going into the lungs where oxygenation takes place and then through the pulmonary vein it comes back into the left atrium okay uh, these are some of the common cardiac diseases we uh, all of us you know who are practicing cardiology uh, we all come across these common cardiac diseases out of which in dogs the mitral valve disease and the dilated cardiomyopathy they would be most commonly seen mitral valve disease uh, would mean that the mitral valve leaflets uh, uh, this connects the left atrium and the left ventricle on the left side of the heart the mitral valve leaflets they get thickened due to degenerative valve disease 
as a result of which there is leakage into the left atrium and the left atrium becomes bigger and bigger as a result of which that will cause compression of the main stem bronchus which would result in coughing which can result in syncope uh, it can also in very advanced stages cause congestive heart failure in which uh, you know there is fluid build up in the lungs Some, uh, dilated cardiomyopathy on the other hand uh, means a systolic myocardial heart failure so the contractility here is affected the uh, the left atrium is unable to contract properly as a result of which there is stasis of blood within the heart the cardiac chambers they become bigger and bigger and it results in all the associated symptoms uh, there is a common mistake which which i have seen that just on the basis of x ray uh, a lot of people mention dilated cardiomyopathy well i mean on the x ray if the heart is big it does not mean dilated cardiomyopathy you have to it can be one of the differentials dcm can be one of the differentials but you always always have to correlate it by doing an echocardiography because a enlarged heart can be a mitral valve disease can be dcm can be hypertrophic cardiomyopathy can be uh, uh, arvc so it can mean a lot of things but dilated cardiomyopathy specifically means systolic myocardial heart failure in which the contractility of the heart is affected so if you see a big heart then the next steps will be to do further diagnostics echocardiographies ecgs dcm uh, you come to a diagnosis only through an echocardiography when the contractility is affected coming to arvc which is very commonly seen in boxers we also call it uh, boxer cardiomyopathy it is arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy so in this uh, there are ventricular ectopic sites means you know within the ventricular myocardium uh, there is impulse conduction happening at at uh, false places which should not be happening as a result the right side of the heart the right atrium and the right ventricle that becomes enlarged over a period of time and uh, you know, all the resultant signs and symptoms of a right sided uh, heart failure they develop other diseases which not stenosis uh, aortic stenosis and pulmonic stenosis specifically in uh, some of these breeds like french bulldogs english bulldogs even boxers uh, you would come across at times uh, ventricular and atrial septal defects well uh, they would need advanced equipment uh, they would need good ultrasound machines uh, they are not very common but yes i mean if uh, uh, you know as you do echocardiographies more and more and uh, develop expertise in this then one can uh, diagnose these conditions ventricular and atrial septal defects these would mean that there is a hole in the ventricular uh, septum and the atrial septum and that results in the flow between uh, uh, you know the two atria and the two ventricles respectively pda's uh, patent ductus arteriosus it's a congenital heart defect it means that there is an abnormal connection between the pulmonary artery and the aorta so in in the fetal life the, the, uh, this hole is there which has to close at birth in those cases where it doesn't it leads to a patent ductus arteriosus so the blood from the aorta it flows into the pulmonary artery and as a result it would lead to overflow and Uh, volume overload you know in the pulmonary circulation uh, this disease patent ductus arteriosus over a period of time will cause severe left heart cardiomegaly why the left heart cardiomegaly because from the aorta the blood is going into the pulmonary artery there's more blood which is going into the pulmonary artery and from the pulmonary artery it, it is going to the lungs and through lungs it is coming into the left heart so over a period the left heart becomes volume overloaded and big 
then in cats you know hcm hypertrophic cardiomyopathy in which the walls of the left ventricle they become thickened uh, this is one of the most common heart conditions in cats i in my practice see a lot of persian cats and it's it's a very uh, it, it's actually quite a common condition i've seen i've realized that it's hcm more and more of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy cases we are encountering these days and uh, hcm cases also many times in the end they lead to congestive heart failure there is pulmonary edema and then uh, you give diuretics you, uh, you know, give oxygen a lot of them i've seen that they show good recovery as well uh, dcm in cats is not very common it's in fact i would say after rcm rcm is restrictive cardiomyopathy so after rcm we encounter dcm so in terms of how common these conditions are uh, top on the list would be hypertrophic cardiomyopathy then comes you know restrictive cardiomyopathy in restrictive cardiomyopathy it will lead to a diastolic dysfunction both the atria the right atrium and the left atrium they become enlarged the walls they become stiff and it's a ventricular diastolic dysfunction uh, dcm on the other hand is uh, again a systolic myocardial heart failure in which dilated cardiomyopathy as i was saying is a systolic myocardial heart failure in in cats uh, you generally see it in a lot of taurine deficiency cases so those cats which are not on uh, commercially available cat foods and are on home diets are more prone to catching dcm coming to arvc it's not a very very commonly found heart disease but yes sometimes if uh, uh, you know you are able to do echocardiographies properly uh, and if you can correlate with the symptoms of right heart failure in cats then arvc definitely should be on the list of differentials it again uh, will cause the right atrium and the right ventricle to be volume overloaded then there are some heart conditions which can cause cyanosis in small animals well you know in all these diseases there is a term which is called eisenmenger syndrome so that basically develops when there is a reverse flow from the right heart into the left heart so the right heart uh, will carry the deoxygenated or the dirty blood and whereas the left heart carries the oxygenated blood so if there is a reverse flow in any of these congenital heart defects be it a patent ductus arteriosus or a ventricular septal defect if there is a reverse flow from the pulmonary artery into the aorta that would that would cause the unoxygenated blood to go into the circulation and that will result in cyanosis uh, some of the other diseases uh, in which you know uh, cyanosis is seen is tof tetralogy of fillot pulmonic stenosis with a ventricular septal defect tricuspid valve dysplasia with a asd and dorv which is a double outlet right ventricle so this i'm just giving you a brief introduction because in the later seminars we will we will be covering all these diseases in details but it's just to get an idea that you know these conditions exist and because of you know how you come across cyanosis in in uh, uh, in heart conditions you know it's just to know that you know these things exist and we'll definitely cover later on in later seminars uh, all these conditions in details then these are some of the breed predispositions uh, dilated cardiomyopathy we come across in doberman pinschers great danes boxers labradors and golden retrievers over here in india since you know labradors and golden retrievers they are very popular and common so we do come across a lot of dcm in these breeds saint bernard's cocker spaniels and mastiffs are again um, very common breeds in which you know you come across dilated cardiomyopathy mitral valve disease cavalier king charles spaniel it's a classical example uh, mitral valve disease is over represented in in this particular breed so if you see a cavalier king charles spaniel uh, at every visit 
when a cavalier king charles spaniel comes to your clinic do the auscultation listen very carefully over the mitral valve area because you know this is one breed which is over represented with mitral valve disease uh dachshunds chihuahuas poodles miniature pinschers cocker spaniels these are some of the other breeds in which we come across mitral valve disease commonly aortic stenosis boxers rottweilers bulldogs gsds great danes mastiffs out of which personally i have seen a lot of the aortic stenosis cases they are boxer breeds bulldogs of late i came across this german shepherd as well uh hcm persian main coons ragdolls british short hairs persians are highly popular in our country so you will come across a lot of hcm in persian cats cardiac disease the clinical signs most of us know coughing coughing is generally either due to the fluid build up in the lungs or this is due to the enlarged left atrium which will compress the main stem bronchus exercise intolerance again with the enlarged heart the lungs have little space to do their work which will lead to exercise intolerance there is oxygen deficiency also in a lot of cardiac diseases which again will cause exercise intolerance dyspnea tachypnea anorexia syncope synotic tongue uh, these are very commonly encountered cardiac uh, clinical signs of you know the cardiac uh, diseases most of us know and have encountered all these signs on auscultation you will come across either a murmur or a irregular heart rhythm or the heart rate would be either slow or fast or it can be a combination of one of these or all of these so you know when any case comes to you and you are doing a cardiac evaluation it has to be a step by step approach so the first thing is going to be auscultation you know careful auscultation but most of us do and some of us don't do uh, auscultation would be very very important because this would uh, give you very early insights and very early uh, suspicion that you know the uh, dog or cat might be having a cardiac disease so the heart rhythm can be irregular if that is the case you do an ecg uh, if there is a murmur present murmur would mean you know the turbulent heart sounds we'll be covering murmurs later on in this presentation but in all these cases uh, you would be uh, in most of these cases uh, you would come across murmurs uh, chest x ray don't do just one view you know you have to be doing the lateral and vd views i generally recommend you know two both the lateral views the right side and the left side and either a vd or a db view and then of course i mean if a murmur is present uh, you would be doing an echocardiography in case you suspect a cardiac disease or in case your pet has a breed predisposition then you know for those places uh, where we don't have echocardiographies cardiac biomarker tests also can be done i mean simple uh, blood test it can be sent to the lab on the lab you can get some idea uh whether you know there is a possible heart disease or not and uh, if there is a breed predisposition for example if it's a cavalier king charles spaniel or if it's a boxer or a german shepherd or a dachshund then definitely you should screen for these various cardiac diseases early on so auscultation uh, as i said it's it's a very important and valuable tool you have to be very patient while doing it you have to have a very good quality stethoscope uh, stethoscopes are not really expensive you can uh, make an investment of 10 20 uh, thousand and you'll get a good stethoscope because uh, what you hear or uh, does matter quite a lot so using a good quality stethoscope is very important and you have to do it very patiently you have to do it in a quiet room and that is how you can detect a uh, lot of these irregularities in the heart early on so if you don't want to miss out on a problem early on auscultation is a very key thing to do but do it properly with patience in a quiet room well the heart sounds there are different kinds of heart sound but first of all it is important for all of us to know the normal heart sounds 
so the normal heart sounds include s1 and s2 you know when you auscultate you hear a lup and a dup lup dup you hear very uh, you hear every time you do an auscultation so in this the lup sound is what we call the s1 and after that uh, the dub sound which comes is the s2 and how these sounds come the origin of these sounds you know it's important uh, it's it's a very basic thing you know which we all should know before we move on to the other advanced cardiology lectures so s1 or the first heart sound which is the lub it is formed when the mitral and the tricuspid valves they close so when the mitral and the tricuspid valves close simultaneously then the first heart sound which is lub is heard which we call s1 on the contrary s2 which is the second heart sound which is dub that sound is created by the closure of the aortic and the pulmonic valves the aortic and pulmonic valves they have to close simultaneously and then you know the second heart sound s2 uh, will be formed and this is an audio clip you know on how these um, uh, normal heart sounds the lup and dub uh, they arise you know this is you know you all can i'll just play this you know this is a very useful audio clip is really useful because it depicts one movement through the cardiac cycle and frames heart sounds temporally in relation to whether they occur during, before or after heart contraction or relaxation. Let's take a closer look at the S1 and S2 heart sound. The S1 heart sound is usually described as sounding like the word lub and the S2 heart sound dub. Let's put the heart sounds in so you can appreciate this better. Let's now take a closer look. I'll play it again. Um, yeah. Let's now take a close. So the S1 sound comes, you know, when the mitral and the tricuspid valve uh, close, and the S2 comes when the pulmonic and the aortic valve close. And these are the two normal heart sounds. uh there is a schematic representation uh, in this video on you know what exactly is this going on. so you all can see it uh one side please just a minute the s1 heart sound occurs when the tricuspid and mitral valves close simultaneously this is followed by ventricular contraction otherwise known as systole and this forces blood through the pulmonary and aortic valves and the s2 heart sound occurs when the pulmonary and aortic valves close a period of heart muscle relaxation then occurs and this is known as diastole after which the cardiac cycle starts all over again let's now add in the heart sounds with this animation Uh, I would like to play this video once again because you know this is a, a normal representation of, of what goes on in the heart and uh, how these sounds are produced. So I would request all of you to observe carefully once again. It's a very short video clip, but it's a, a very useful video, you know, for all of you to understand the basic concept. So I'll just play this once again. Let's now take a closer look at what causes the S1 and S2 heart sounds. The S1 heart sound occurs when the tricuspid and mitral valves close simultaneously. Systole, and this forces blood through the pulmonary and aortic valves. And the S2 heart sound occurs when the pulmonary and aortic valves close. 
a period of heart muscle relaxation then occurs, and this is known as diastole, after which the cardiac cycle starts all over again. Let's now add in the heart sounds with this animation. I hope this was useful. So we spoke about the two normal heart sounds, S1 and S2, which is the lup and dup heart sound, which we all hear, you know, when we do the auscultation. Uh, now we'll talk about the abnormal heart sounds, you know, which in a normal uh, scenario should not be there. So this is the third heart sound, S3. We sometimes call this a gallop heart sound as well. Uh, the S3 is particularly formed by the rapid ventricular filling. You know, sometimes in certain heart conditions like a dilated cardiomyopathy or a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, the ventricular walls, they become very stiff. So because of the stiff ventricular walls, the blood which comes into the ventricles in diastole will hit onto the ventricular walls. And that hitting of the blood on the ventricular walls will cause this third heart sound, which is S3, right? So it is sometimes, uh, many times, in fact, it is a diseased state. And many times in specifically young animals, it can also be a normal finding. But if you hear this, then you have to run diagnostics, echocardiographies, ECGs. You have to run those diagnoses to actually rule out a cardiomyopathy, which might be causing this. Uh, the intensity of S3 heart sound is determined by diastolic ventricular compliance. As I said, you know, the more stiff a ventricle would be, it would be less compliant and the more intense this sound would be. It is not usually audible in healthy dogs and cats, but sometimes in the very young animals, uh, you do encounter this without any pathological heart condition. But as I said, I'll repeat that, you know, if you hear this, do rule out a pathological heart condition. So for this S3 heart sound, I'll play, play this audio clip and this will give you more insights on how exactly this happens. I would request everybody to very, very carefully watch this video because your uh, doubts regarding the S3 heart sound, if any, they will be clear. Though, you know, at the end of the session, for any questions which anybody has, I would be more than happy to answer those. On to S3, otherwise known as the third heart sound. This heart sound occurs during early diastole, just after S2. The word Kentucky is often used to illustrate the timing of the third heart sound in relation to S1 and S2. Let's add in the heart sound so you can appreciate this better. To better understand how the S3 heart sound occurs, we have to add in some blood flow to our animation. The first heart sound is caused by the closure of the tricuspid and mitral valves. And the second heart sound is caused by the closure of the pulmonary and aortic valves. The S3 heart sound is produced by the rapid filling of the ventricles during diastole. This produces audible vibrations, which are heard as the S3 heart sound. Let's now add the heart sounds to the animation. We're going to start in slow motion, but then we'll speed it up to real time. I hope it is clear to everybody. Uh, also, I would request that, you know, since there are lots of audio clips in this presentation, so if you can uh, use AirPods or, uh, uh, you know, head earphones, you know, these sounds will be more clearly uh, audible to all of you.
onto S3. Otherwise, well, now we come to the fourth heart sound, which is uh, S4. So S4 is another form of, uh, it is another gallop heart sound. Gallop heart sound sometimes, uh, you know, when S3 and S4, they combine as one sound, you know, when the heart rate is very high, then again, you know, the combination of S3 and S4 will be also called a gallop heart Sorry. sound. Right. Yeah. So this this fourth heart sound, which is S4, this will happen in the late diastole. So S3 happens in early diastole. S4 happens in late diastole. Uh, this is produced by the atrial systole. And uh, if you have a ECG running at that time, this will be at the end of the P wave. Uh, this again, you know, it's not audible in uh, healthy dogs and cats. So if you see this, if you hear this fourth heart sound, which is S4, then, you know, you have to rule out a pathological heart condition. Uh, there is a small audio clip which will give you more information on how this is happening. Uh, have a very close look you know this is a very nice audio visual representation of what is happening when let's now take a look the at the fourth heart sound otherwise known as s4 the s4 heart sound occurs just before s1 in late diastole the word tennessee is often used to help describe the rhythm produced by the added fourth heart sound let's add in the heart sound so you can better understand it Let's now take a closer look at why the fourth heart sound occurs. Now, because the S4 heart sound occurs momentarily before S1, I have changed our graphical representation so that it now starts with diastole and ends with systole. Blood flows into the atria and ventricles during diastole, and the fourth heart sound occurs when atrial contraction forces blood into abnormal, non-compliant ventricles. This produces audible vibrations, which are heard as the S4 heart sound. The S1 heart sound is produced by closure of the tricuspid and mitral valves, and the S2 heart sound is produced by the closure of the pulmonary and aortic valves. Let's add in the heart sounds now so that you can see this work. We'll start this one in slow motion and then speed it up to real time. I hope this was useful. Well, gallop heart sounds, uh, even the S3 and S4 sounds, we label them as gallop sounds. And many times, as I mentioned, uh, when S3 and S4, they get louder and both S3 and S4, they combine, it can cause a more louder sound. Uh, we call this a gallop heart sound. We don't call it a gallop heart rhythm. That is different. Uh, this is a gallop heart sound. And this, uh, to summarize it, this generally happens in hypertrophic cardiomyopathies, in restrictive cardiomyopathies, in dilated cardiomyopathies any disease which will call, cause stiffening of the ventricular wall, ventricular myocardium, can cause this gallop heart sound. Uh, and whenever this happens, you have to, as I said, you know, you have to rule out a primary heart disease. Okay. There is another term called as a split S2 sound. This also sometimes, you know, you would encounter. So the LUP is the, the first heart sound is S1, the dub is the S2. So there can be a split S2. How this happens, the basic concept is that the 
S2 sound, it develops on the simultaneous closure of the aortic and pulmonary valve. Now, if these aortic and pulmonic valves, if they don't close simultaneously, if they close at different time intervals, that will create a split S2 sound. How that uh, commonly happens is in cases of pulmonary hypertension. So any disease which causes pulmonary hypertension in which the pressure in the pulmonary artery that increases, that will cause this phenomenon to occur because, you know, there would be resistance of the blood flow through the main pulmonary artery and it will lead to a delayed closure of the pulmonic valve as a result you know, it will lead to a split S2 sound. It's, it's a good thing to know, you know, because all these, uh, these are basic, uh, the very basic concepts of cardiology. And uh, I wanted to start with auscultation because auscultation is the first step, you know, after only, uh, you know, any x-ray interpretation, any ECG, any echocardiography, any biomarkers, they all come later on, you know, the first thing, the first step is auscultation. So, so this, you know, we all have to know by heart. I mean, we can actually uh, not miss a lot of things uh, in our routine practice. You know, if we do a proper auscultation, you know, when we are talking about uh, cardiology. Heart murmurs, well, you know, these are all vibrations from within the cardiovascular system. Uh, these vibrations, as I had mentioned early on, these are consequence of turbulent blood flow. And let me tell you that not all animals with heart murmurs have a, have a cardiovascular disease uh, because there would be some murmurs which we'll, we'll be discussing, which are called innocent murmurs, which happen in the first one year of life and they later on they disappear. And sometimes there can be other murmurs which can be caused because of uh, things like anemia in which, you know, the viscosity of the blood decreases and that will also cause a turbulence. So not all heart murmurs. Uh, would mean a cardiovascular disease, but again, you know, if you hear a murmur, you always have to rule out a functional heart disease. Well, these are some of the important location of the heart valves. Uh, mitral valve is on the left side of the heart towards the apex, somewhere around, this is the area of the mitral valve. So it will be somewhere around the fifth intercostal space you move a little bit more upwards towards the uh, fourth intercostal space at the base of the heart you will see the pulmonic valve uh, sorry the aortic valve and you move a little cranially towards the triceps muscle and you will have the pulmonic valve so it's it's a good thing to know where these different valves are located because you know when you are doing the auscultation uh, you need to know if a sound is coming with maximum intensity from a particular area, you know, that would tell you that this valve might be affected. The tricuspid valve is on the right side and uh, uh, in cases of tricuspid regurgitations because of tricuspid valve dysplasia, sometimes in very advanced cases of mitral valve disease, uh, you have a tricuspid regurgitation that will again uh, 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 you know, give you, you, uh, you'll hear a murmur in this area on the right hand side. Location of sounds, well, you have to listen over all the valve areas. You start from the base apex, then you move towards the base. And let me tell you all that the auscultation has to be done on both the sides. So sometimes, you know, we very quickly do an auscultation on the left hand side and not on the right hand side. Well, do it on both sides.
well this is just to uh, give you an idea how the murmurs they they are formed so think of a hose pipe you know if the blood is flowing normally in a laminar fashion there would be no vibrations you know if you increase the uh, speed of the flow then there would be vibrations uh, which can be felt and which can be heard uh, because of the turbulent flow so you can compare it uh, in a similar fashion to how murmurs within the heart how they arise similarly if there is a stenosis of a valve through that valve the blood is going to move out faster with increased velocity and that will again uh, create turbulence and vibrations and you hear it as a murmur so the heart murmurs can be pathological uh, where there is a valve disease where there is a congenital disease it can be physiological as i mentioned in which you know the viscosity of the blood decreases in anemic conditions the blood basically becomes thin and the thin blood will create those vibrations and will create that turbulent uh, flow resulting in the murmur innocent murmurs uh, means you know that there is no functional heart disease in very young dogs uh, you would hear this you know when uh, the heart rate is high uh, you know when the uh, when they are very lean in shape and size you know you can hear these uh, again you know when you hear these you rule out a functional heart disease and if your echocardiography is another test they are normal uh, would mean that you know these are innocent murmurs and they would generally fade away by the age of 8 10 maximum 12 months heart murmurs can also be described primarily in terms of the timing whether they are systolic systolic murmurs mean that they would happen between s1 and s2 heart sounds so the lup dub heart sounds which you commonly see in between these heart sounds uh, if you hear a murmur uh, would mean that it is systolic diastolic murmurs would happen after the second heart sound the s2 so s1 s2 lup dub you normally hear after the second heart sound which is the dub after that if you hear a murmur that is a diastolic murmur continuous murmurs they happen throughout the cardiac cycle systole diastole you know the continuous murmur is going to happen throughout you know we generally see continuous murmurs uh, which we also called as machinery murmur uh, based on the location based on the point of maximal uh, intensity like for example uh for a mitral valve murmur you will have the point of maximal intensity at the apex on the left hand side so that becomes the location for a mitral uh, mitral valve murmur for a pulmonic valve murmur uh, 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 for an aortic valve murmur the point of maximal intensity would be the base of the heart so based on the locations and based on the point of maximal intensities you can uh, classify these murmurs then the intensity which would mean the grading i'll come in the uh, slides which are just going to come up shortly uh, murmurs are also described in terms of the shape frequency and radiations and we will be shortly covering these so the murmur timing as i said Uh, it's systolic you know if it begins with or after the s1 and it has to end with or before the s2 so systolic murmurs are between s1 and s2 diastolic murmurs they begin with or after the s2 so after s1 s2 and before s1 in the diastolic phase continuous would mean that it's a continuous machinery murmur which we see in pds as i mentioned which will be throughout the cardiac cycle the point of maximal intensity as i said uh, for a mitral valve it would be the apex of the heart for the aortic valve murmur it would be the base of the heart and radiation would mean the direction of blood flow which is causing the murmur the murmurs they can also be described in terms of shape uh, there is a band shaped murmur there is a crescendo decrescendo murmur there is a decrescendo murmur and there is a machinery continuous murmur which we commonly encounter in pdas 
this is good to know i mean uh, uh, you know how we describe these murmurs because some of the very basic concepts you know if you imbibe uh, from this presentation it, they they will help in your routine practice so i have tried to uh, make these slides from the point of view of clinical relevance you know what we all commonly encounter and how uh, uh, you know this can help all of us in our daily routine practices i have tried to include in this there is a short audio clip regarding the shapes so i would like to play that good at with practice the other thing we describe sometimes is the shape of the murmur so we might have a band shaped murmur associated with a leaky mitral or tricuspid valve which sort of goes it has the same sort of frequency all the way through in animals with stenosis of the aortic valve or the pulmonic valve we often hear a crescendo decrescendo murmur and the classic decrescendo murmur is the diastolic murmur that we hear in horses with aortic insufficiency so we hear and we've talked a little bit about continuous murmurs that go all the so in the band shaped murmur the frequency will be uniform throughout between the s1 and s2 in the crescendo decrescendo shaped murmurs the frequency will go up and then it will decrease between the s1 and s2 in the decrescendo murmur that will start with a high frequency and high intensity it will slow down whereas in the machinery murmur it would be uh, more or less continuous throughout good at with crap then we come to the grading of murmurs you know when we are uh, writing our uh, auscultation uh, the grading becomes important uh, for a mitral murmur you may write it as just an example a grade 3 systolic murmur with a point of maximal intensity over the apex right so this is how you describe a murmur a grade 1 is a very soft focal murmur it will be heard only with a very very careful aus auscultation and uh, you have to be very patient Uh, while doing your auscultation grade one murmur will be a very focal very soft murmur sometimes you know it's uh, very hard to detect it but with a very uh, quiet room you know you can uh, uh, hear this grade two will be easily heard it would be a low intensity murmur which would mean that you know it would be softer than s1 and s2 so you know the when when we talk about grading you uh, you know you keep hearing the two hearts normal heart sounds which are s1 and s2 and whether the murmur which you are hearing hearing is softer or louder or of the same intensity than s1 and s2 uh, will help you with the grading you know so so in grade 2 it will be a low intensity murmur it will be softer than s1 and s2 means you know the lub and dub sounds uh you will hear uh, with more intensity in a grade 2 murmur and this would be easily heard over a point of maximal intensity it is again always focal which would mean that it would not be radiating to other valve areas grade 3 would be a moderate intensity uh, murmur it would be the same intensity as the two normal heart sounds s1 and s2 and it can sometimes radiate to other valve areas but on the same side of the chest there is a no palpable precordial thrill in this palpable precordial thrill would mean you place your hand on the chest and sometimes you know you feel these vibrations on the chest sometimes you know there are owners who come to me and they say that uh, that you know there is there are some vibrations happening from the chest so you know uh, when they tell me this i automatically i know that there is some cardiomyopathy which is highly suspected so the precordial thrill is uh, are those vibrations which you feel you know when you put your hand on the chest grade 4 will be a very loud murmur it will be louder than the normal heart sounds s1 and s2 and it would radiate to other valve areas and it would also radiate to the other side of the chest so a grade 4 mitral valve murmur 
would mean that the point of maximal intensity is at the apex and it is radiating uh, to the right side of the chest as well. Uh, grade 4 murmurs, they can have an intermittent precordial thrill as well. Grade 5 would be very loud murmurs. They would al almost always have a palpable precordial thrill. They would radiate to all the valve areas, uh, but they cannot be heard with a stethoscope of the chest. The differentiation between a grade 5 and grade 6 would be that in grade 6 murmur, you will be able to hear it even with the stethoscope not completely in contact with the chest. So if even if you move your stethoscope a little bit away from the chest and if you are hearing the murmur, it means it is a grade 6 murmur. Now why I am telling you about uh, you know all the uh, grading and classification of murmurs because they would uh, tell you whether you whether the pet is suffering from a uh, uh, severe heart disease or not. So a grade 1 to 3 murmurs, we would classify it in the mild to moderate disease category. Grade 4 to 6, you know, where the precordial thrill comes specifically, would mean that it's a severe heart disease. You know, so it becomes a red flag in your mind also. And then you can educate the client. This is a comparative study of, you know, the normal heart sounds and with a murmur. So I'll, I'll play the normal slide first. Uh, I'll turn on the maximum. So this is a normal heart sound. I mean, you have to listen very carefully. This is a mitral murmur. So between the S1 and S2, you hear those uh, drum-like sounds, you know, the abnormal uh, sounds. I'll play it once again. This is normal. One last time. This is normal. Mitral murmur. This is a very high intensity grade 6 moment. So in this you are unable to hear the uh, the normal S1 and S2 heart sounds, you know, because the murmur intensity is so high that you are unable to hear the lup and up. There is also a difference between the normal dog and cat heart sounds. Uh, we all uh, know about this and we've all heard, uh, uh, you know, the variation in heart sounds between a dog and cat. But, uh, but a quick recap. This is a DCM murmur. So why a murmur develops in a dilated cardiomyopathy? Well, you know, uh, there is no valve problem as such in, in cases of dilated cardiomyopathy. That means the contractility of the heart is affected. But because of the systolic dysfunction, because of the poor contractility, there is leakage from the mitral valve and the tricuspid valve in a lot of cases. So DCM murmur in a lot of cases will be a very soft murmur on the left side of the chest. I'll play this again. Now you can yourself, you know, you can make a comparison that the mitral murmur, which was grade five and six, which was I was playing 
that was a very loud murmur dcm murmurs mostly are soft murmurs well we come to murmurs in cats the cardiac heart murmurs in cats are broadly classified and uh, 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 you know there are you can say two kinds of murmurs in cats the most common one is the sam which we come across in cases of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy sam is caused by the systolic anterior motion of the mitral valve and this you are going to hear on the left side of the chest uh whereas dr voto is a short form for dynamic right ventricular outflow obstruction so you know this is an obstruction in the area of the tricuspid and the pulmonic valve uh dr voto is less commonly encountered sam is very commonly encountered uh, any hcm cat you hear a murmur it in most of those cases is called sam so this is a systolic anterior motion of the uh, mitral valve and it's, it's a reason for the murmur in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy cases sam is going to cause an outflow obstruction of the left ventricular tract and it's a dynamic murmur so murmurs in cats you know sometimes they are very difficult to detect because you know murmurs are dynamic in cats so with a slow heart rate the murmur is going to disappear and as the heart rate increases you will be able to hear the murmur so sometimes you know if, if the heart rate is slow you have to uh, uh, kind of increase the heart rate you have to um, you can even uh, like they do in europe and us they talk to the cat they sometimes tease the cat as to increase the heart rate so that they are able to detect the murmur because unlike dogs murmurs in cats they are all dynamic dynamic means that with a fast heart rate only they are audible otherwise they disappear so uh, talking about sam sam is a is the name of uh, you can say the name of the murmur uh, which is the reason for uh, this turbulent heart sound in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy cases uh, in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy as you can see on the screen the ventricular walls the left ventricular walls they become thickened as a result what happens is that the mitral valve it touches the interventricular septum here you know where uh, where you know on the screen you are seeing the arrow over here this anterior mitral valve leaflet it is coming in contact with the left ventricular interventricular septum and as a result of this contact between the anterior mitral valve leaflet and the iv septum uh an obstruction in the left ventricular outflow tract is caused and because of this obstruction the turbulence which comes because of this will lead to a murmur which is called sam the other murmur which i spoke about is uh, not very common we call it dr voto it is a short form of dynamic right ventricular outflow tract obstruction it is caused by the systolic narrowing of the right ventricular outflow tract usually it is a benign murmur it is a dynamic murmur which would mean that only you know when the heart rate is fast you will be able to hear it and uh, it is caused in conditions like anemia or hyperthyroidism or inflammatory conditions of the right heart very rare with hcm um, from the point of view of clinical relevance uh, sam is important because you know that is the murmur which you very very commonly and in fact in most of the cases of uh, feline cardiomyopathies you would be hearing sam only and dr voto on the other hand it's good to know about it but it's not very common in cats well now we've uh, discussed about the normal and abnormal heart sounds i hope it was all clear to everybody uh, if certain things are not clear you can always you know at the end of lecture uh, get in touch with me uh, ask me any questions and even after this presentation is over you can still you know get in touch with me uh, so that you know we can all collectively learn all these very basic cardiology concepts coming to the abnormal lung sounds 
uh, it is very important to know about all these norm it is actually important to know the normal as well as the abnormal lung sounds because uh, sometimes you know i have seen that a lot of my colleagues uh, they misrepresent the normal lung sounds for the abnormal lung sound so if you know what is normal only then you know you can go on to abnormal so we'll be covering up both the normal as well as abnormal lung sounds in the coming slides i have a lot of audio clips as well for this proper lung auscultation again you know it's it's very important it gives us the possibility of it gives us an idea about the possibility of a congestive heart failure so these are the commonly encountered abnormal lung sounds you know the wheezes ronchis stridor stutter fine crackles coarse crackles uh, crackles be it fine or coarse coarse crackles you also can call them rails you know there can be moist rails there can be dry rails so these are all terminologies and uh, you know what i would like to request all of you that you know these terminologies please un- inculcate and start using these in your prescriptions you know so whenever uh, any case comes to you of course you know be it a, a case e- even if it is coming just for vaccination you would still be doing the auscultation right so with the auscultation start writing all these various terminologies you know once you start writing all these terminologies you will see the difference in 6 yeah, months so all these you know i will be covering one by one first of all let me uh, uh, give you a audio clip of the normal lung sounds so the normal lung sounds how they are produced the air you know when it is traveling uh, you know from the uh, nostrils it is going into the trachea it is going into the bronchi it is going into the alveoli so through all these spaces within the respiratory tract uh, you know the sounds which are produced of the air tra- traversing through these structures within the respiratory tract there would be some normal lung sounds you know. so this is normal i mean if the animal is resting is relaxed you may not hear these but in the clinical situations uh, you know in in the clinical situations where there is uh, a lot of anxiety where there is a lot of panting you would very commonly hear this which is normal coming to the abnormal lung sounds we classify them in these uh, broadly into these categories you know uh, these are the crackles which can be the fine crackles and the coarse crackles uh, we hear wheezes we hear ronchi uh, two of the other uh, terminologies which are not in Uh, which you are not seeing on the screen uh, would be the stridor the inspiratory stridors and the expiratory stertors you know so so those are two other things which i will be covering shortly but let's first of all discuss about the fine crackles so the fine crackles they are these uh, ra- high pitched rapidly damped non musical lung sounds you know it's important to know how these happen how these are created so these are created basically by the explosive opening of the small airways so it creates a brief high pitched inspiratory uh, lung sounds you know the small airways uh, uh, mostly in uh, i'm talking about the alveolar sacs so the alveolar sacs when they are uh forced to open you know with a sudden forced opening of the alveolar sacs you know then these fine crackles they are produced uh they can be secondary to lung water pulmonary edema 
uh, whenever there is some infiltration in the interstitial space that is going to counter the traction and scaffolding effects of the alveolar septae which are going to normal man normally maintain the potency of the small conduction airways through exhalation so so a basic uh, concept is that you know these are created by the forced opening of the alveolar sacs uh, the popping uh, open of the small airways uh, will cause fine crackles and they can uh, happen at any uh, cycle of the inspiration but depending on the under underlying pathological cause uh, you know with sudden airway opening or compression you you will hear these and when hundreds of small airways they open simultaneously you know then you hear these fine crackles it's similar to pulling apart a velcro you know so the when you pull apart a velcro what you hear is similar to fine crackles um, early inspiratory crackles are often associated with the obstructive lung diseases such as chronic bronchitis and asthma whereas the mid to late inspiratory crackles are mostly associated with things like uh, diseases like interstitial fibrosis pneumonia and pulmonary edema there is this short audio clip of you know what you will hear when i'm talking about fine crackles coming to force crackles the coarse crackles they are usually lower pitched but they are longer in duration than the fine crackles and how this sound is created is by the rupture of the fluid membranes uh, in the upper respiratory tract which will be the mouth the pharynx larynx trachea and the first few generations of bronchi so it is happening in the upper respiratory tract uh when you go towards an animal and if the animal uh is appearing to be congested to you like you know when we have uh, a cold uh that you can uh, relate to the coarse crackles uh, they are differentiated from the fine crackles by the fact that one can easily hear them over the trachea and at the mouth so when a person as i said or animal is congested as you go near them you are hearing coarse crackles uh they are commonly encountered in the conditions of the upper respiratory tract tracheobronchitis the the inflammatory disorders of large airways you will hear these this is an audio clip of what you will hear when i'm talking about coarse crackles coming to wheezes you know if we compare them with crackles wheezes are much longer in duration and wheezes are mostly continuous sounds continuous would mean that in inspiration and expiration you will uh, hear them uh, you'll hear them both in inspiration and expiration that is why we call them continuous uh, sounds they are musical sounds associated with the narrowing of an airway the classical uh, wheeze is, is the asthmatic uh, wheeze you know in in cases of asthma there is bronchoconstriction and that bronchoconstriction will cause uh, the wheezes they are also caused by vibrations of the small bronchial walls so you know if there is a structure if there is a mass or if there is a mucus uh, plug somewhere in the bronchi so you know the vibrations which are set up between 
the mucus plug or the mass and the bronchial wall will give this sound which we call the wheeze. Uh, as I said, in the classical example is asthma and uh, it, wheezes can accompany a lot of other conditions as well. Uh, before this, I'll show you an audio clip in which you know you will hear wheezes as well as coarse crackles. So I hope it was clear. The wheezing sound in this one can easily uh, distinguish. Though there were crackles also, there were coarse crackles. Uh, the differentiation between fine crackles and coarse crackles also now uh, with these audio clips hopefully should be clear. I'll play this audio clip once again. I hope this was useful. Now we come to ronchi. So in contrast to wheezes, these are low pitched. And these are caused by the vibrations of the large airways. So the wheezes, they were caused by the vibration of the small airways. Ronchi, these are caused by vibrations from the large airways. And uh, uh, they generally happen uh, in pharynx, larynx, or trachea. They are caused by the rupture of the air and fluid interfaces, which would mean as uh, the animal is breathing in or out, the air it comes in contact with the fluid which is built up in the large airways because of a disease. And because of the rupture of that air fluid interface, you will hear these ronchi, which are very typical to snoring type of sounds and it again can be heard heard at the level of trachea over the thoracic wall. Uh, many cases of tracheal collapse, tracheal collapse or tracheal stenosis we commonly encounter and uh, you know, many of these cases uh, you will hear this sound which we call the ronchi. I'll again play an audio clip just to give you an idea. So the snoring type of sounds we call the expiratory ronchus. There is another audio clip. Uh, this is a cat with a ronchus and this was because of the intrathoracic tracheal collapse. snoring type of sounds you can relate to ronchi. I hope it was clear about uh, uh, you know the heart and the lung auscultation. Uh, there were a lot of audio visual clips at the end of the session. Uh, all these will be shared uh, with all of you and you know you, when you listen to these again and again uh, if there are any doubts, I am sure those will be clear. Now I, I come to uh, the end, uh, the last topic of my session, which is the biomarkers. Uh, biomarkers which we all currently use are cardiac proponents, CTNI is the short form, NT Pro BNP, and CPK MB, out of which uh, I'm sure CPK MB, a lot of us uh, 
you know analyze the initial suspicions of uh, uh, you know relating to cardiac diseases by doing the cpk mb test well my request to all of you is to uh, use more of nt pro bnp and cardiac troponins because uh, because those are more specific it's not completely wrong to use cpk mb but it is uh, not very specific compared to nt pro bnp and ctni you know when we are talking about cardiac biomarkers well i mean if you have uh, the facility of echocardiography uh, nothing like it because you know all your suspicions will be be clear in that but sometimes you know when the diseases they are in the occult stage in which you know there are no symptoms uh, but still you suspect that you know it may go into the direction of a heart disease maybe because of the pre predisposition or the genetic history then you can consider using these uh, cardiac biomarkers there was a case of a german shepherd you know uh, which came to be last year in which you know they just came for a uh, normal cardiac checkup and they got the echocardiography done on the echocardiography i did suspect that the systolic function or the contractility of the heart is slightly affected uh you know then i uh, did this nt pro bnp uh, pro bnp test and the levels they came to be very high and that particular case after 3 months from that day uh, actually developed clinical dilated cardiomyopathy so what i'm trying to tell all of you is that uh, you know uh, if there is any suspicion or a breed predisposition or a genetic history then you can uh, use the these useful cardiac biomarkers and try to use nt pro bnp and cardiac troponins as these are now commonly available in various cities in india these are more specific than the cpk mb uh cpk mb is also produced in the myocardial in cardiac biomarkers are better as i said uh, so the reason why i'm saying that cpk mb is not very specific because you know the half life is is very short so if you have to do a cpk mb analysis then you have to take multiple samples in a day for a period of at least 2 days to analyze it properly whether there is an actual cardiomyopathy or not but you don't need to do that because you have the option of nt pro bnp and cardiac troponins so use these nt pro bnp uh, comes in the form of uh, these kit tests as well uh, so you can you know use these and these are quite specific both ctni and nt pro bnp when we are talking about the uh, troponin so these are some of the cut off values i mean you don't really need to uh, uh, you don't really need to completely uh, know these because you know these cut off values you can cut and paste somewhere in your uh, clinic but uh, but as i said you know start using these troponins are produced uh, whenever there is a myocardial cell death or necrosis so when there is a uh, cardiac cell death or necrosis then these substances which we call the cardiac troponins uh, they are released into circulation and the cut off value of more than 0.22 nanogram per ml is very specific to detect all forms of cardiomyopathy uh there are some of the other values and cut off values which we, you know we've taken from the research journals uh more than ctni value more than 0.139 nanogram per ml is suggestive of likely echocardiographic changes and more than 0.34 nanogram per ml is suggestive of sudden cardiac death in doberman pinschers with enlarged heart this is a study uh, from the munich university nt pro bnp is a stretch biomarker so cardiac troponin uh, happens when the myocardial cell dies or there is necrosis whereas nt pro bnp is a stretch you know whenever there is additional stretch on the myocardial walls stretch would be when there is cardiomegaly right so whenever there is a 
cardiomegaly uh, leading to additional stretch or whenever the walls are thickened or stiff in cases of diastolic dysfunctions in cases of hcm so that uh, this stretch biomarker which is nt pro bnp that will be released in the circulation i particularly use it uh, quite a lot at my practice though you know i rely more on the echocardiographies but i still use it you know whenever there is a suspicion or in my at my practice in uh, the night emergency cases where the night emergency doctor is not able to perform the echocardiography and if he or she suspects uh, suspects an underlying cardiac condition then you know they collect the samples and do this test uh again these are some cutoffs less than uh, 400 picomoles per liter is normal more than 500 picomoles per liter is occult dcm possible uh which would mean that more than 500 uh dcm may be likely but you have to confirm it with an echocardiography more than 900 to 1800 is again a gray zone where dcm is highly likely but again you know the final gold standard test would be echocardiography more than 1800 is almost definitive for dcm but let me tell you one example where you know uh, these biomarkers specifically nt pro bnp can be high without a cardiac disease there was a case where it was 3400 without a functional cardiac disease because i had confirmed it with an echocardiography so that was a case of a severe lung fibrosis which in turn led to pulmonary hypertension and uh, in cases of pulmonary hypertension uh, uh, this nt pro bnp value will be high so a pulmonary hypertension uh, uh, secondary to a lung disease where there is no primary cardiac pathology would elevate the levels of nt pro bnp falsely so this is just one uh, differential which you need to keep in mind uh, but to summarize uh, uh, the topic of uh, cardiac biomarkers uh, again my request would be to use more of nt pro bnp cardiac proponents C- uh, cpk mb is uh, can be used but it is compared to nt pro bnp and cardiac proponents the specificity is lower comparatively so use more of nt pro bnp and ctni this was a study of nt pro bnp in dobermans and uh, uh, you know this just tells us uh, how specific this is the uh, this is from a research and as you can see almost more than 80% specificity for nt pro bnp uh just about i'll just take another 10 minutes because i have some video clips of the common heart conditions uh you know for all of you to have a close look at these uh, mo- a lot of you may have already encountered these you know who are already doing echocardiographies uh, but for those of you who have, who have not it is just a quick insight into the common heart conditions which we see in dogs and cats so this is i'll play this uh, video clip and you all can guess you know what this is you in fact uh if somebody wants to turn on the mic and tell me what this is uh, you guys are most welcome uh right peristernal long axis yeah yeah but what disease is this okay this is i think mitral valve inception scene yes correct so this is a case of a mitral valve insufficiency so whenever you are doing your examinations my suggestion is you know first of all do a subjective evaluation when you are talking about echocardiographies do a sub- subjective evaluation straight away don't jump to conclusions see the contractility see the valve areas put on some color uh, see if there is any regurgitation so you have to have a birds eye view you know so with a birds eye view you get a gross uh, idea about what is going on so in this case both the mitral valves they are severely thickened i'll show you another view this is the left apical view and again it's the same dog this was in fact a cavalier king charles spaniel 
and the mitral valves both of these they are highly highly thickened i mean anybody can make out see the mitral valves are here and you see the thickening these are both the mitral valve leaflets this is the tricuspid valve uh, this this is severely thickened uh, this is the long axis view in the echocardiography this is the short axis view Uh, this is a just a comparative study of what a normal versus an abnormal mitral valve will look like. Right? So this is a normal uh, mitral valve. You can see this is the uh, anterior mitral valve leaflet. This is the posterior mitral valve leaflet. There is no thickening, and you can see that it is the heart uh, is contracting very well, and the mitral valves are absolutely normal in this. If you compare it to this uh, clip, the mitral valve, sorry, the mitral valve leaflets here, you can see how thick they are. You know, so a comparative study is always good. You know, it gives us good. Uh, it, uh, it, I mean, it, it clears our concepts in the long run when you make a comparative study. This, you know, we put some color and all the rainbow colors that you are seeing here. Uh, there is a massive mitral valve regurgitation. As a result of that, there would be severe left atrium dilatation, and that will cause compression of the main stem bronchus. It will cause all the signs associated with the heart disease. Okay, so can anybody tell me what uh, this is? This I can tell you for sure. This is again a case of a mitral valve disease. You can appreciate how big the left atrium here is. But what I am trying to show all of you here is, can anybody tell me about the rhythm of the heart? So in the previous slides, the rhythm was uh, good. In this, do you see any abnormality with the rhythm? Well, this is a case of a atrial fibrillation. Atrial fibrillation is one of the most common arrhythmias along with ventricular premature contractions. Uh, this is one of the most common arrhythmias in cases of cardiac conditions in small animals, more specifically in the mitral valve disease and DCM. So in this, you know, there would be uh, a very erratic, fast heart rate and atrial fibrillation in, in this case you know, it's it's like a it's it's like a irregularly dancing uh, heart. If you have a close look, it beats very erratically, irregularly, and the heart rate is very fast. And the left atrium in all these cases would be very very big. You know, so uh, atrial fibrillation will cause huge left atrium volume overload. This is the other view. Again, you can see you know it's very erratic. It's very fast. You know, it's you all can appreciate this. These are similar videos, massive regurgitation. You see how fast the regurgitant jet that is moving into the uh, left atrium. So the heart rate becomes so erratic and so fast, you can easily uh, make out the difference. Uh, atrial fibrillation on the ECG will look like this. So, you know, in those cases, in the previous slides, if you do an ECG, it would look some, something like this. And in this, let me tell you all, you just have to look at three hallmarks, you know, for atrial fibrillation. Uh, this is, again, a very basic cardiology um, ECG because this is an abnormality which you very, very often, you, uh, you, you would all see in cases of DCN and mitral. So you don't see a P wave uh, before the QRS complex in any of these. Uh, second would be that the heart rate would be irregularly irregular. So you see that there is no fixed pattern. It is uh, becoming slow, then fast, slow, fast. It's very erratic. So we call it irregularly irregular. And the third would be a supraventricular tachycardia. The heart rate would be very high. I mean, it would be a 
supraventricular tachycardia because the morphology we call it a supraventricular tachycardia because the morphology of the qrs complexes that is normal in this ventricular tachycardia would mean that the morphology of qrs complexes would be abnormal so to summarize atrial fibrillation on an ecg would have these three hallmarks hallmark number 1 absence of p waves hallmark number 2 irregularly irregular rhythm and hallmark number 3 supraventricular tachycardia this is a slide which uh, this is a clip which i'm going to play and you can uh, do your guesses as to what this is let me tell you that this is a cat well this was a case of a dilated cardiomyopathy in a cat in fact this cat uh, you know this uh, you know on the slide you can see the date this was 5th june 2018 and with medical management um, this cat came to me in a very bad condition with pulmonary edema ascites and everything but the owners they were highly compliant they used to do all that i used to tell them and then this cat finally died in 2022 so from that condition survive for 4 years is a very rare thing uh, in in this you know you will have a eccentric uh, jet so in cases of dilated cardiomyopathies the regurgitant flow through the mitral valve would be eccentric you know it will be in a stream unlike a primary mitral valve case where it would be uh uniformly spread within the left atrium here it is a eccentric jet because there is no primary mitral valve pathology it is secondary to systolic dysfunction so this is the left apical view you can see you know the jet is uh eccentrically directed it is not uniformly spreading within the left atrium because there is no primary mitral valve pathology so in this you can appreciate that uh sorry i'll just go back so in this you can appreciate that the systolic functions if you have a very close look the contractility of the heart is affected so as i said you know with a birds eye view you know you all should uh, figure out that what is going on so here the first thing which when my when uh, you know when i look at this video clip is that the contractility is affected here right so that immediately my differential list would open up and on top of that differential list would be a dcm and when we talk about dcm in cats you have to think about taurine deficiency dcm if the specifically if the cat is on a home diet this again is a normal versus an abnormal comparison this is a normal contracting uh, heart the systolic functions contractility is absolutely fine whereas this is dilated cardiomyopathy heart is barely able to contract all the chambers they are big in uh, echocardiographic terminology uh, we call them volume overloaded because these are uh, overloaded with the extra volume of blood so you know when you compare this is a normal nicely beating heart this is a dilated cardiomyopathy systolic myocardial heart failure this is from the short axis uh i might be covering uh, uh, you know the basics of echocardiography is how to take the views how to take the measurements but for now you know i just want all of you to ha have a subjective view of you know how the heart is beating this is again a nicely beating heart this is normal heart you know this is the short axis view what we call and see here the heart is barely able to contract again this is normal versus a dilated cardiomyopathy heart is not able to contract okay so this is a slide from a cat the cat was uh presented to me with uh, congestive heart failure there was pulmonary edema the first thing i heard when i was so when i was doing the auscultation i heard fine crackles i heard a, uh, a murmur which 
uh, we hear in certain cardiac conditions in cats. So, uh, you know, we did a quick echo. I had to do a quick echo because the cat was not in a condition that, you know, she would lie down for a long time because she was uh, highly critical with pulmonary edema, severe dyspnea at that time. But can you make out what this is? You know, specifically, if you look at the walls of the left ventricle, if you carefully, yeah, so this was hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And uh, again, this particular cat, we had to admit her. Um, we admitted for about three days. Uh, we kept her in the incubator. We gave good amount of oxygen. We gave good amount of diuretics. And fortunately, the cat is doing fine now. Uh, coming to the last few slides, this I wanted to show you from a German research. A lot of my slides would be from you know German researchers because my uh, advisor during my master's program was uh, is, is a German, uh, Dr. Gerhard. You know he's from the University of Munich. So over there, you know Germany is highly reliant on a lot of researchers. They do a lot of R&D before commenting on anything. So they've done this research on German shepherds in which, you know, there is a condition in which the dog who is absolutely normal, a German shepherd dog is absolutely normal, will all of a sudden collapse. And that is because of these inherited ventricular arrhythmias in which, you know, you will see a lot of uh, ventricular premature beats. So this is how a ventricular premature beat looks on an ECG. And in uh, these cases of GSD's uh, sudden death, which they've labeled, uh, would have a lot of these uh, VPCs, multiple couplets, triplets. And uh, uh, let me tell all of you that, you know, whenever you are doing an ECG, just, doing, uh, just don't quickly do it. Have a very close look on the ECG machine where you are getting the reading for a good five to 10 minutes at least, because uh, you know, you may miss out on certain arrhythmias if you just do a five to ten seconds uh, ECG. So no, even a normal ECG at my practice, I generally take out at least three to five strips and, and I have a very close watch con continuously on the ECG machine where these readings are coming. Or in these cases, if you have a Holter monitor where you know you put a holter monitor and it gives you the reading for 24 hour period so you can in those 24 hour period you can through a software count the number of these arrhythmias so we, so a ventricular premature beat if you are having let's say le less than 15 24 hours would uh, mean that you know you need to test more and you need to probe more but uh, it may not be lethal but if there are more than 100 vpcs uh, would mean that your that that particular pet is at risk of a sudden death because you know these become red flags and you can uh, communicate the same to the owners. Then coming to the boxer cardiomyopathy, the ARVC in which you know there are irregular uh, impulses and these ectopic arrhythmias arising from the right ventricle, which we call the arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy. Uh, this is commonly called as boxer cardiomyopathy and in you know when you have this again you will have a lot of vpcs uh, on the ecg reading and if you do the echocardiography you will see the right atrium and the right ventricle to be dilated the treatment uh, which i th this is though this is from the uh, slide but even i have had very good experience with sotelol uh, you have these Sotelar 40 NG tablets and you can use them once to twice uh, per adult dog per day. If alone this doesn't work, then I usually add a sodium channel blocker, which is called mexilitine. And either using one of them or sometimes a combination works very well for these VPCs. But, you know, these are things which you need to communicate to the uh, pet parents so that they are aware about the condition and it was a shock to them you know when the dog collapses uh, ventricular premature beats we've uh, covered in, in this you know it would look like this there would be no p wave before 
uh, uh, you know the complex and it would be a wide and bizarre uh, QRS complex like this. Uh, this is again another slide in which you know you are seeing these ventricular premature beats and when this comes it is a red alert. Uh, these also happen sometimes in cases of uh, gastric dilatation and volvulus. Uh, but in that, you know, when you do the surgery and you uh, correct the defect, after that, these are automatically gone. You don't need to treat these in those cases. This is uh, my last slide for the day. And this is a, a good 3D uh, view of, you know, what goes on in the heart. I hope you all will like it. That brings me to the end of this session. I hope you all enjoyed it. If there are any doubts, uh, we all uh, can discuss. So great, Dr. Uh, uh, one more achievement I would like to tell you that we started almost with the 350 veterinarians on a busy Sunday afternoon. And most of the veterinarians have their one uh, evening holiday only. And even then, uh, more than 350 veterinarians joined this webinar. And even at this point, when two and a half hours are gone, 180 veterinarians are there. So that shows, uh, first of all, the magic of your uh, uh, presentation, how much valuable data you were sharing with the veterinarians. Second thing, I believe our purpose are being solved as a veterinarians. Uh, we started uh, at Ori Hill by a vet for the vets program. So I used to go to the seminars and I used to see that we had to take a bunk from our hospitals and clinics for two, three, two, three days. And sometimes uh, you don't get these valuable things at a single place. So by sitting in our bedrooms or in our clinics and we can learn this valuable things and such a wonderful speakers are available and you are helping us to learn this difficult topic of cardiology. Uh, Kudos to you. Thank you very much for being Thank here. Having me here. Thank you all. So uh, uh, we will request Dr. Bhanu to come again for the next session soon. And with that, we will be sharing this video very soon on the YouTube channel so, so that you can revise the whole session which we have shared today. Thank you very much, everyone. Have a good Bye. Sunday night. Bye.